This week, um, someone that I consider to be a business mentor and a friend in my life, uh, Heike Berg, he announced the release of his brand new book on the 27th of September, which is called, uh, which is Geroep Vermeer. Okay, so it's Afrikaans book. But um, it's actually, in English, it's called For More. And I haven't read the book yet. It's only going to be released on the 27th. But I want to really read that book because when I heard the title of that book, you know, it just inspired me. And it ju just spoke to my heart. And, you know, I remember a, a, a couple of months back, I talked about your calling and how important your calling is. And um, I believe your calling is very important, but I also believe that we need to realize that we've been called for more. And his book actually inspired the title of this message. I just wanted to, to give credit for that to him because his book inspired the title of this message, even though I haven't read the book. But, and the title of the message that I want to share with you this morning is this. You are called for more. You are called for more. So, we are called for more. And, you know, I don't know about you, but that really resonates to me. And it speaks to my heart. And, and I believe that, and I want you to listen to this statement, that I believe that our wildest dreams don't come close to what God has prepared for us. Our wildest dreams don't come close to what God has prepared for us. And it is amazing if you, you know, if you see this capacity to dream. You know, I see this capacity to dream in Joshua. You know, it's amazing when we are little how we have the capacity to dream. You know, you want you to, to he has this dream. He said to me the other day, he said to us, no, he wants to go and he wants to live in America. And uh, he wants to build two mansions. You know, one mansion for himself and one mansion, a double story mansion, by the way. A uh, double story mansion, one for himself and one for his friend Lazuko. And uh, they're going to stay together. And uh, they're going to have um, slides that are connected to each house. And in the morning when they wake up, they're just going to jump on the one slide and they're going to, you know, just slide to one another. Okay, so, so, you know, they have this capacity to dream. Okay, now I don't know if that's God's plan for his life. I'm not saying it's God's plan for his life. But... But isn't it amazing our children have this capacity to dream? Now, I don't know if you remember, but there was a time in your life when you were also a child. There was a time when you had dreams. There was a time when you were dreaming these crazy dreams. And what happens sometimes is that, I don't know what happens, but, but sometimes we allow this capacity to dream to get knocked out of us. You know, and I believe that God has a dream for all of our lives. God has a dream for all of our lives. And I want you to know this this morning. God has a dream for you. God has a dream for you. And sometimes we have to learn how to dream again. We forget how to dream, but God still has a dream for you. So, do you still know how to dream? Have you forgotten how to dream and I believe just like Joshua we are all born with these God-given dreams on the inside of us but we allow the circumstances of life to knock them out of us you see the responsibilities of life the pressure of life the circumstances of life and sometimes all of these realities they actually they scream at us and they tell us that this is all there is. My current circumstances, my current life, my current situation is all that there is in life. It's, it's all that is available to me. And, and we believe that that is all there is. But let me ask you a question this morning. And I want you to hear this. Who puts those limits on your life? 
Who puts those limits on your life? And who tells us that that is all there is? That's all you are ever going to have. That's all you're going to ever experience. That is going to be the summary of your life. Now, Pastor Steph already said it. We place those limits on ourselves. And I, and I believe that to be true. We place those limits on our lives. And we're going to talk about that this morning. But I want us to see there's a story in the Bible about a man who was called for more. A man who was called for more, but the circumstances in his life said that that is all you're ever going to be. The people in his life said to him, that is all you're ever going to be. But praise God, he knew that he was called for more. He knew he was called for more and he refused to allow the circumstances of life to determine what he was going to be and who he was going to be. Now I'm sure you've heard of this man before. His name is David. Okay, David. And we're going to talk about him, a little shepherd boy called David. And we're going to read about that in 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1 to 13. So if you have your Bible, you can read with us. But just listen to this. It says, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul? See, Saul was king at that stage, and God decided that Saul was not going to be the king because he didn't have a heart for God. Since I have rejected him as king of Israel. So God rejected him as the king of Israel. Then he said, fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Okay, He was afraid to go to do what God told him to do. But then we read, the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Verse 3, invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint me for the one I indicate. Okay, you see God had already had a plan. Verse 4, Samuel did what the Lord said. And when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Verse 5, Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. And then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited him to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, and I want you to listen to these words especially, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Okay, and then we see Abinadab comes and he stands before Samuel. Um, we see all of the other brothers come and stand before, for, uh, before Samuel. But the Lord says, each of them is not the one that I have chosen. Every one of them is not the one that I have chosen. And then verse 11 we read, So he asked Jesse, Are all these the sons you have? Okay, can you imagine? Are all these the sons you have? So he even forgot about little David, the shepherd boy in the field. Okay, when, they were, when the king was going to be anointed, one of my sons is going to be, but forget about David. Okay, he's just the shepherd boy. Okay? And then it says, Samuel says to him, sorry, uh, Jesse says, there is still the youngest. Jesse answered, he is tending the sheep. And Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. You see, sometimes God makes the people around you sit and wait until when it's, your, when it's the moment that he has appointed for you. Then we see verse 12. So he sent for him and had him brought and he was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him for this is the one. Verse 13, so Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And Samuel then went to Ramah. Okay, and I want us to focus on verse 7 and verse 12. And I'm going to repeat those verses. But verse 7 says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. 
The law does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And verse 12, so he sent for him and brought him. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. You see, when God chooses someone for a purpose, when he places a dream in someone's heart, he doesn't consider the outward appearances. He doesn't look at the circumstances. He doesn't look at his height. He doesn't look at, you know, what is going on around his life. He doesn't look at what people are saying. But he looks at what is in your heart. And what is in your heart? It is the dream that God has placed there. It is the dream that God has placed there. You see, when it comes to your purpose and the dreams that God has placed in your heart, just like David, he says to you, you are the one. You are the one. You are the one that I have this dream for. You are the one that I have this purpose for. You are the one that I have this plan for. He places it in your heart and, and he, he says to you, it doesn't matter what is happening around you. It doesn't matter what people are saying. It doesn't matter what circumstances are, playing, uh, are, are, are happening around you. It is what God has placed in your heart. What is the dream that God has placed in your heart? You see, and this is the question that I want to ask you this morning. Do you believe you are the one? So say to the person next to you, I am the one. Okay? You are the one in whom God has placed a dream. You are the one in whom God has placed a dream. Not just the person next to you, but God has placed a dream in your heart. But in order to have that dream and live that dream, the first thing that you need to do, and you can write this down, you need to embrace God's dream for your life. So let me ask you this morning, have you embraced God's dream for your life? Okay, I'm not talking about man's dream. I'm not just talking about goals. I'm talking about have you embraced God's dream for your life? Okay, and we read about that, and I was reading this in the Passion Translation, and it is so beautiful, and I want you to listen to this. Ephesians 3, verse 14 to 21. This is a prayer of Paul. And listen to how beautiful this is in the Passion Translation. It says, So I kneel humbly in awe before the Father of our Lord Jesus the Messiah, the perfect Father of every father and child in heaven and on earth. Verse 16. And I pray that He would unveil within you everybody say within me the unlimited riches of his glory and favor did you hear that the unlimited riches of his glory and favor until supernatural strength floods your innermost being with his divine might and explosive power isn't that powerful God wants to flood your being with His light, with His life, until you are filled with His explosive power, His dunamis power. Verse 17, then by constantly, everybody say constantly. Okay, I'm going to use a few, a few words that I want to emphasize. So, by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside you. And the resting place of His love will become the very source and root of your love, of your life. Then verse 18 and 19, then you will be empowered to discover, everybody say empowered. What every holy one experienced, the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. How deeply intimate and far reaching is His love. How enduring and inclusive it is. Endless love beyond measurement that transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pours into you until you are overflowing with the fullness of God. His extravagant love, He wants to pour it in you until you are overflowing with the fullness of God. Verse 20. Never doubt. Everybody say, never doubt. God's mighty power to work in you and to accomplish all of this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, 
your most unbelievable dream and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all for His miraculous power constantly energizes you. Isn't that amazing? You know, listen once again to verse 20. Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you. Never doubt God's power to accomplish everything that He has, His dream in you. Never doubt that power. And listen to this. He will achieve infinitely more. Everybody say infinitely. Infinitely more than your greatest request. What is your greatest request that you've ever gone to with God? God won't just do that. He will do infinitely more than your greatest request. He will do more than your most unbelievable dream. What is the most unbelievable dream that you have ever had? God can do more than your most unbelievable dream. And He will exceed your wildest imagination. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds to me like our wildest dreams don't compare to what God has prepared for us. Our wildest dreams don't compare to what God has for us. So, think for a moment about your biggest dream. And then I know sometimes when you talk about that, it's like people get uncomfortable. You know, when you start telling them, start to dream, they get uncomfortable. Okay, they don't want to talk about their dreams. They don't want to think about their dreams. They don't want to, you know, spend the time to, to, to delve a little bit deeper and, and find those dreams. But think about that biggest dream that you've ever had. I don't know what it is. You know, maybe you believe that God has called you to go to another country and do something there. Maybe God has called you to build a church. Maybe God has called you to set up a training organization. Maybe God has called you to witness to people somewhere in the world. Maybe God has, has called you to start a business. You know, it doesn't matter what God has called you to do. And whether you feel that is the biggest dream that I can ever have, listen to this. God can do infinitely more than your biggest dream. God can exceed the dreams that you have in your heart. And if you think that is impossible, God says it is possible. You see, and this is the thing. The Bible says, James 4 verse 3, it says, We have not because we ask not. We have not because we ask not. Sometimes we don't ask God for the dreams that He has for us. Matthew 7 verse 7 to 8, Jesus says, Ask and you will receive. Knock and the door will be opened for you. Matthew 17 verse 7, If you have faith as a mustard seed, how many of you know how big a mustard seed is? It's the smallest seed that there will ever be. But if you have faith as a mustard seed, the Bible says you will say to this mountain, Move there and it will move. And listen to these words from Jesus Nothing will be impossible for you. Nothing will be impossible for you. You know, do we believe that? Do we believe that with God, with the dreams that He has placed in our hearts, that nothing is impossible to us? You see, God, and this is what I want you to notice this morning, God is not limiting us. God is not the one that is limiting us. God is the one that says, I have great dreams for you. I have dreams for you beyond your wildest imaginations. Okay, but we are the one that is placing a limit on the dreams that God has placed on the inside of us. So how do we stop that? So you need to embrace the dream that God has for you. The second thing that you need to do is that you need to take responsibility. Okay, take responsibility let me ask you who placed the dream on the inside of you god whose responsibility is it for that dream to come to pass yours okay god works in us okay but he also works out of us okay he worked it into you but he wants to work it out of you and to work it out of you you have to do something. You have to take responsibility for that dream. So how many times do we take responsibility for the dream that God has placed in our hearts? 
Okay, we, we treat it like it's this polished trophy that is standing there in a, in a case. We treat it like it's something that, you know, one day I will get to that. You know, one day when life isn't so busy. One day when, when I have time. One day when, when the opportunity is good enough. One day when the circumstances of life is, 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 is okay. One day when I have everything under control. Let me ask you for you, how many of for you has those one day, well, that one day, has it come yet? Okay, if we're going to wait for that one day, it's not going to come. You see, one day will never come until you take responsibility. Take responsibility for the dream that God has placed in your heart. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 out of the easy translation, it's the first time I heard of this translation, but the easy translation, it says, Today, I want the sky and the earth to hear what I have said to you. Okay, and this is God speaking. He says, I want you to hear, I want the sky and the earth to hear what I'm saying to you. He says, I have told you what you may choose. Everybody say choose. You see, what does God give you? He gives you choice. He gives you the opportunity to choose. And he says this, he says, you may choose life or death. You may choose life or death. You see, whose choice is that? It's ours. God says, I put all of these things as a witness against you. Choose life or choose death. You may choose the Lord to bless you or curse you. So let me ask you, how many of you are going to choose death this morning? How many of you are going to choose that God curse you this morning? Okay, none of us will consciously do that, will we? But have you noticed that if we don't take responsibility, sometimes we unconsciously choose that. If I'm just going with the flow, if I'm just going with the circumstances of life, those things I have unconsciously chosen the curse. I have unconsciously chosen not to do the will of God. You see, and if we don't choose, if we don't make the decision, then nothing will happen. We have to take responsibility and listen to what God says the last part of that verse he says choose life today so that you and your descendants will live you see your choice is not just going to affect you it's going to affect those that come after you it's going to affect your children it's going to affect your lineage and everyone that God puts in your bloodline so I want to see that if we want to see God's dream for our lives comes to come to pass, we have to take 100% responsibility for the dreams that He has placed in your heart. Have you taken 100% responsibility for the dreams that He has placed in your heart? You see, what we achieve, the results we produce, the quality of our relationships, the state of our health, our physical fitness, our income, our debts, our feelings, Everything in our life, we have to take 100% responsibility for what we produce. See, we are producing those things in our lives. And we have to take 100% responsibility for what we produce. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not blind to the fact that it's not easy. You know, I'm not saying it's easy. But all good choices are never easy. Okay, if it's easy, it's probably not good for you. Okay, so... All choices that we make are sometimes hard until they become easy. You see, sometimes it's hard in the beginning, but when we start to do it, it becomes easier. Okay, now, there's a story that I heard about Jim Rohn, and he, he, he tells the story of he's talking to his mentor, and uh, his mentor was Mr. Shove, and he asked him, he said, Mr. Rohn, can I ask you, why hasn't your life amounted to much? Okay, has everyone ever dared to ask that question to you? Why hasn't your life amounted to much? And Jim Rohn said, Mr. Shof, I'm so glad you asked. Let me give you all the reasons. And he started saying, he took out his list and he started blaming his parents. And he started blaming his boss. And he started blaming the economy. And he started blaming the weather. And he started blaming the country. And he started completing everything on his list and he complained and he complained and he complained and 
Everything on his list, he started naming before Mr. Sheriff. Now, let me ask you this morning, how many of you have a list like that? All of the things that you are blaming because our lives is the way that it is. But then Mr. Sheriff said to him, Mr. Rona, you finished with your list? And he said, yes. And then he said, there's just one problem with your list, Mr. Rona. You are not on it. You see, sometimes we want to blame everything and everyone around us for us not achieving what we are achieving. For us not living the dreams that God has placed in our hearts. But, but we are never on our list. And we have to be on our list. You see, most of us have been conditioned to blame something outside of ourselves for the parts of our lives that we don't like. We blame our parents, our bosses, our friends, our co-workers, our clients, our spouse, the weather, the economy, the lack of money. Anyone or anything we can pin the blame on, anyone or everything except ourselves. You see, if we want to live the dreams that God has placed in our hearts, then we are going to have to take 100% responsibility for our lives. Okay, and why am I saying that? You know, sometimes we think that, you know, it feels so hard to take responsibility for your life and to actually put the blame on the shoulders of the one that deserves it ourselves. But that's also very empowering. Because if I take responsibility, then I also have the power to change my situation. If I believe that it's not all those things outside me's fault that my life is what it is, then I can take responsibility, then I have the power to change my life. I have the power to change my relationships. I have the power to change my circumstances. I have the power to change my finances because God has given you that power. He has placed on the inside of you the power to do that. You see, if we want to live the dreams that God has placed in our hearts, we have to give up all our excuses. We have to give up all our victim stories. How many people do you know that have been in worse circumstances than you could ever imagine and they still complete and fulfill the dream that God has for them? You know, so many times if we hear the stories of people who live the dreams that God has for them, it's often people who have gone through some sort of difficulty. It's often not people who, who don't do anything, they don't achieve what God has placed in their hearts. You see, but we have to take 100% responsibility. We have to give up all of our excuses forever. We have to make the choice that I will take 100% responsibility and work with God to accomplish the dreams that He has placed in my heart. You see, sometimes, and that is sometimes the hardest thing for us to do, because sometimes the problem is not the circumstances around us, it's the mindset within us. It's the mindset within us. And that brings me to the last point that I want to share with you. That we have to break free from limiting beliefs. Say to the person next to you, limiting beliefs. <laughs> okay, do you know what a limiting belief is? I think it's self-explanatory. It says that it's a belief that limits you. It's something that you believe that is limiting your life. Proverbs 23 verse 7 out of the Passion Translation says, For as he thinks within himself, so is he. As he thinks within himself, so is he. Rabbi Shamil ben Nachmani said, We do not see things as they are, we see things as we are. Did you hear that? We do not see things as they are, we see things as we are. As we think we are. As we think we are. Okay, not as you do you are. As you think you are. Okay, that was good grammar, wasn't it? Okay, but as we think we are. And from God's, do we see things from God's perspective? Or do we view these things through our, through our personal lens? Through how we view things? Okay, Pastor Michael always uses the example, you know, when... You look through, if I have a blue glass here in front of me, and I look through that blue glass, everything around me will look blue. And I think sometimes people are looking through a blue glass because sometimes they look very blue. 
Okay, but they have this blue, they, they're always looking through these blue glass, these lenses. And if you look through blue, uh, blue lenses, everything will be blue. But that's not how things really are. But that's how I see things. And for me, that is how they are. You understand what he was saying when he said, we do not see things as they are. We see things as we are. You see, so how we see things creates the reality that we live in. Sometimes we have placed these limiting beliefs on ourselves and it is these limiting beliefs is the way that we see things and we have to change that if we're going to ever fulfill the dreams that God has for us. So I want to quickly share with you four limiting beliefs that we have. The first one that I believe a lot of people have is a scarcity mindset. Everybody say scarcity mindset. You see, this is the belief that there's never enough. Whether it is resources, whether it is opportunities, whether there's abilities. And if we have this mindset, the problem is that we think small. We limit ourselves by what we see around us, rather than trusting in God's abundance of provision. You see, I don't know if you know this, but the God that we serve is a God of abundance. The God that we serve is a God of abundance. He's not a God of just enough. He's not the God of, of less than enough. He's the God of more than enough. His name is El Shaddai. His name is not El Chipo. Okay? He's El Shaddai, the God of more than enough. So, the Bible says, John 10 verse 10, it says, Jesus said, He said, I came so that you can have life in abundance until it overflows okay does that sound to you like an abundant god philippians 4 verse 19 god says i will provide all your needs according to my riches and glory psalm 23 verse 1 says the lord is my shepherd i lack nothing ephesians 3 verse 20 says god can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we dare ask or think you see, He's the God of abundance. And the problem is, is that we, if we have a scarcity mindset, we focus on what is missing in life. We focus on, on everything that we don't have. While well, faith in God's among, abundance actually reminds us that with God, there is always enough. You know, I don't know if you've, if you've ever um, went to heaven before, but I don't know, I don't think the, the, the bank of heaven is doing bad. Okay, I don't think there's, there's, there's uh, in heaven any shortages. Okay, the Bible actually says that the streets are gold. Listen, they are not made of gold, they are gold. Okay, the finest, purest gold that there will ever be. Okay, there's no lack in heaven. And I don't know if you notice, notice this, but when Jesus taught us to pray, He actually said this. He said, Father, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, God is not a God of lack. He's a God of abundance. The scarcity mindset says, I have to hold on tightly to everything that I have. Faith in God says, I can give freely because my God owns it all and He can provide for me. Scarcity, scarcity mindset is all about self-preservation. You know, I just have to preserve myself. Be careful, preserve myself. While faith in God says live generously and confidently, we give and live with open hands because we believe that God's supply cannot be exhausted. And isn't that exactly what Jesus demonstrated? You know, when He was on earth, He never focused on lack. When there was lack, there was provision. And He didn't have a scarcity mindset. You see, fear of lack keeps us stuck. But... Faith in God's abundance propels us into the future that God has for us. You see, if you're going to stay in that fear of lack, you're never going to do what God has called you to do. Because that fear of lack will always say to you, I don't have the money. How many times have you had an opportunity and when that opportunity came, you said, I can't do it because I don't have the money. I don't have the resources. I don't have the 